everybody, my name is Phil Driscoll. Welcome to The Awakening. I hope you're awake because if you're not, you're going to be before this is over. I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Mark Messines. We've been friends for mm, a long time. <laughs> and Mark is a, he's a medical doctor and he's He's just involved in a lot of scientific things, and I love the way his mind works, because musicians only count to four, and Mark counts to four billion. So we're going to have a good time today, but we're going to start with this. If you have subscribed to the theory, and you might be sitting here drinking a beer, you might be in some bar, you might be in a nightclub, you might be in a hotel room all by yourself, but if you've have bought into the theory that God is dead, God's not alive, God's not cool, God is not happening. If you have bought into that misnomer, then this program is for you because by the end of it, I think you will see clearly that God is not a concept in which we reveal our pain like John Lennon said. He is much more than a concept. He is living, he's alive, he has power, and he can change you no matter what's going on in your life. But Mark and I were talking about the fact that so many young people, even who grew up in a Christian environment, in a Christian home, at some point when they go to college, you know, and we bought this thing, well, go to college so you can really get an education. Okay? But the bottom line is, if where they go robs them or destroys their faith, then that is not right. And I guess the percentage is somewhere around 80 or 85 percent, Mark, you and I have talked. I remember the first time you took me to Hugh Ross in an apologetics uh, convention or conference, whatever you call it, and he began to talk about the fact that the earth was in the only place in the universe from which we could really see all of the handiwork of God. Is that right? And it would appear that uh, man, uh, in the time that man has been here, we have this uh, opportunity to see the cosmos clearly uh, in a way that if we were at any other time in history, um, we wouldn't be able to. And uh, of course, Hugh says it more elegantly and uh, with uh, a lot more fact, but I certainly have read that and I know that to be true. It is amazing. But so God placed us at the right time in history so that we could see his handiwork. I find that fascinating. Wouldn't it be just like God if he created man in his image and desired for mankind to live a life of fullness, of fulfillment, wouldn't it be just like God to position us in exactly the strategic place in the cosmos where we could look out through the technology that, you know, God had to be involved in the technology of a telescope? Come on, right? He puts us in a place where we could actually see His handiwork. I don't know how about, how, I don't know how that affects you, but it makes me want to stand up and cheer because that God that created all of that created you and has a plan for your life. You know, I want to take off a little bit on um, your opening, Phil, and that is uh, we do have a crisis today um, in the church and I have read statistics as high as 85 percent of uh, kids that go off to university believing uh, deny their faith by the end of the first year. And I think the question that has to be asked, of course, is why? That's the question. And it's been looked at pretty closely. And you know, um, recently I listened to Frank Turek, who is a, a great guy out of Charlotte, North Carolina, who really spends his time on college campuses. And he goes and he, he queries kids and he has debates and and uh, uh, question and answer seminars. 
And his conclusion is, is that they weren't prepared. They know what they believe, but they don't know why they believe. And I have to tell you that that was my experience. Uh, I went to university as a Christian. I'd had uh, my conversion experience in high school. And when I got to university, I couldn't really defend on that level why I believed what I believed. But I can tell you over the next few decades, I was blown away at the mountain of evidence and the hundreds and almost thousands of years, really 1900 years of research and of people that went before us in history that grappled with the same questions that I was grappling with. The exact same They're thing. not different. They might be a little, there may be some nuances, but the really exciting thing is that historic Christianity has, we stand on the shoulders of giants, the giants of history, some of the most intelligent people in recorded history who didn't come to faith because their mother told them that there was a God. They actually came as skeptics. And as I began to look at that, I was astounded that there was a body of evidence um, that really pointed to a creator and answered those big questions. Undeniable. Apparently so. You know, and so we stand on the shoulders of intellectual giants who um, were looking for God and found him, you know. So this is not a new rodeo, as we say. This is not something that is just a few decades old or in the last decades, decades old or some phenomenon of the last century. We have a very rich history of men and women from every conceivable culture on this planet who asked the questions and found the answers. Now I think of Augustine of Hippo, I believe it was the third or fourth century that St. Augustine uh, found faith. I think of, of Thomas Aquinas and some of these other men that I knew nothing about, nobody had ever mentioned them to me. And as I began to study their lives and realize the struggles that they had and the answers that they came up with. And so that really excited me because when I went off to university, I thought, we have nothing. I have no answers for any of this. The more you look at science from your position of microbiology to a Hugh Ross astrophysicist, there's no question that God's handiwork his footprint is everywhere. Well, I would say that we have answers. We absolutely have answers. And that was the question that I had early on was, do we have answers? And I can tell you that every day of my life, I devote to this subject and to this quest of looking for the answers. It feeds me, it really just propels me in life. And I can tell you that nothing is a slam dunk, as I've said before, never will be. We know, we know in degrees, but I can tell you the preponderance of the evidence, if you look, I believe will point you uh, to your creator. And I would say to parents of kids that are about to go off to university, you do a disservice if you don't get them apologetic training, if you don't get them and expose them to the tough questions and of course, let them find the answers. It's a disservice because once you hit the university, um, there are tough questions that are asked. And unfortunately, the universities are not going to give them an answer that uh, comes from a Christian worldview. They're just not. not. And it's not that it's evidence. Evidence is not the issue. Uh, the issue is what is your worldview? What's your point of view? What's your, what are your biases? What are your presuppositions? Nobody comes to the table without biases and presuppositions. And for me, that was the game changer when I understood that. So I, I would just encourage parents to really get their kids involved. There are great resources in America today. They did not exist when I was coming up in the 70s. Today, there are wonderful ministries. I'd just like to mention 
uh, Reasons to Believe, www.reasons.org. Wonderful. Ravi Zacharias, R-Z-I-M. Uh, I believe it's .org or .com. These are great ministries that have devoted themselves to equipping and training believers so that we can give an answer to everyone that asks, what's the reason of this hope? Is there anything to it? Or is it just fluff? Do you just believe because someone told you to believe? Or is there really evidence behind your faith? That was a game changer for me. It really was. Tell me, Mark, if you, if you were just to take one small example from your field of endeavor, right? From a science position, how that you can see God clearly, unmistakably, in that field. Give me just an example or two. Well, I would say that the opus magnus of God's creation has got to be uh, our genetic material, DNA. Uh, DNA is, is a real buzzword today. It's a really hot topic. It's extremely exciting. And it is the most dense digital technology in the universe. Uh, we know the digital world. We all live it now. We carry it in our pockets, in our cars. And yet, here in cells that are very old, we find a digital technology that is so compact that it can hold uh, an abundance of information such that you can make a human out of that small nano sized piece of microfilm, if you will. And a lot's been said about it much more elegantly than that. But I would say that as I look at DNA and I look at how it works and the, the elegance of it, it's majestic and it bears the signature of a super intelligence. And when I began to understand that and look at that, and many people have, and there have been great books written about it. Steve Meyer from the Discovery Institute has written Signature in the Cell. I think it's a marvelous book. Um, he talks about DNA and about the signature uh, in the information content of DNA. And of course, it's hotly debated. And uh, there's a lot of opposition to that idea. But I got to tell you, common sense dictates when you look at this that there is the fingerprint of God. I would say that's the biggest. And our understanding of DNA just continues to grow. It seems like orders of magnitude. The more we understand, the more excited we become, the more we are amazed at this information processing system, which houses the blueprint for life. It's mind-blowing. Since I know nothing about DNA, to someone who really even barely understands it at all, explain it. Well, I can, I can say that it's, it is a digital technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a code. In fact, it's several codes within a code that is so precise and houses uh, information for um, the blueprints for the most complex machine in the universe, which is us, okay? Um, you know, and as we look at it, I mean, to me, it is, uh, it is just a, it's a marvel of the universe that something like this exists. And it goes right back to the very beginning of life. You know, origin of life researchers look at this, and uh, a lot's been a lot's been written about it. But I would just say that DNA is one of those obvious uh, structures that points to God. I would say the other thing that points to God uh, that really got my attention is our mind, and wow. and how that we possess this ability understand ourselves and to understand the universe that 
first of all, that the universe is comprehensible. Well, the fact that we can understand the universe, that we can understand it mathematically, that we can come up with the mathematical equations that describe the dynamics of the universe. Albert Einstein himself said this, the most, uh, and I don't know the quote directly, but something uh, akin to one of the most marvelous things or mysterious things rather about the universe is that it's understandable that we can actually understand it. And the fact that we have the ability to understand ourselves, to understand the universe, to understand beauty, to be able to look outside of ourselves and correct our own selves when we're about to make mistakes, is really an, a marvelous thing. And there are many great philosophers of mind today some of whom do not believe in God, but will tell you, this is unexplainable. This is a real mystery to us. And you know, you don't see any other animals, any other creations, any other creatures sitting around thinking about the things that we think of. Uh, it's a hyper jump when you look at other animals and you look at what we possess. And the fact that you and I are sitting here and we are communicating and that we have these thoughts and that we can trust our own minds to lead us to truth demands an answer because if our minds are just the product of some random irrational blind mechanistic process why would we even be able to have confidence in what we think and in our ability to be able to know truth. And this is a, this is a very deep question that's being, an, that's being asked today. And it's one that, that really intrigues me because we do have confidence in our ability to know truth. We do, and we know that we, you know, within limits, we can trust our ability to know what's right and wrong. I mean, I drove here today and I followed a map and I had confidence that I was gonna get here and I arrived at my destination. But that required a mind. And uh, the fact that we're taught that God has endowed us with his image. And philosophers, especially theologians, will tell you that that image involves this mind. And it involves this ability of ours to ask the questions and to find the answers and to recognize beauty and to recognize intelligence. You and I know the signature of intelligence. We recognize it all day long and we know when there's not intelligence behind something. So I would say without going off the deep end here, those two subjects, which are off the top of my head, are two things that we possess that are more than marvelous. And I gotta tell you that common sense dictates that those things don't happen by themselves. Um, you know, when, with all of the computer technology that you know, that I know, still can't come close to the mind. It can't cannot. come close. The whole ability to reason and to pick up things, you know, and almost spiritually as if it were. That's, a computer can never do that. That's right, and even with the advances in artificial intelligence, which are very exciting, and uh, I think are, are really gonna help us, um, you're still not gonna get a computer that feels and that mourns. That's the essence of it. And, and that, the whole emotional content. That's of right, and that desires, and uh, that loves, and that can really recognize beauty like we can. You're not gonna get that. That is something that's uniquely human. Uh, and I think it is emblematic. It is a, a picture of our creator and that um, it requires a lot of explaining. But I think it's, it's marvelous enough to me as just a regular guy on the street. I want to know, why do I possess this? Why does this exist? Because it leads me somewhere. And I think that these are the types of subjects that, and the questions that we should be having. You know, we're talking about kids, 
you know, I was one of those kids at one time that, that went off to university and was challenged, severely challenged. And I don't regret that. The other thing I do regret and that I've learned from is that I wasn't prepared. And today we do not have the luxury of not preparing. And you uh, know, if, if it was that kids. way, if it was that way when you were in school, it's exponentially that way today. It is a more aggressive, there's no question, it's a much more aggressive uh, atmosphere, um, the gloves are off. Against? No question. The gloves are off, and the uh, assertions of orthodox historic Christianity are highly offensive to the world that we live in. They're being challenged at every turn. And you know, that's where the church thrives. So we shouldn't let that necessarily trouble us. Uh, that's what the early church faced when it left Palestine, left Israel, and went into the world. It faced a world of various philosophies, aggressive philosophies um, that it had to contend with. And it was that atmosphere that propelled historic Christianity into the world. So that's where the church thrives. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be worried about that. I think as Americans, we got lazy, we got used to favor. Well, that favor, I think, is diminishing if it's not gone. But that's okay. Uh, that's not what's necessary. Just not necessary. What's necessary is that we have the ability, I think, to seek truth, to speak truth. Let us hope that we don't lose that. And that we have the opportunity uh, uh, in the um, public square to be able to ask the questions and to give the answers. I believe it, Mark. No matter who you are, if you're out there, and during this time, you begin to feel something in your heart. That something is the Spirit of the Lord. See, the Bible talks about how that God is a spirit. And you know, you were created with a spirit. We are spirit beings. We live in a body, but we are spirit beings. And that's what separates us from all other genres. But Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And this, the purpose of this has not been to set forth some kind of big science extravaganza. It's simply to say, that regardless of the position of science and the place that you're studying it, all of science declares that God is real, that his power is real. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. With the invention of more technologies, we have more miserable people on planet Earth than ever. With the invention of great wonderful drugs. We have more people who are addicted to those drugs and who find out that after a while those drugs don't fulfill them, don't satisfy them. The bottom line is only Jesus can do it. And he's not a religion. He is a person, a real being. And when you receive him, you don't receive religion. You receive a connection directly to God himself. And that's what this is about. And Mark, let's just pray with everybody. And I want to just, just believe God right now. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I send the word of deliverance and healing to every person under the sound of this voice. If you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, just say this with me. Jesus, I believe that you're real. And I ask you to come into my life and to forgive me for anything I've done wrong, but to just come into my life and to teach me who you are. I want to open up my life to you right now. And I receive you and I want to serve you in Jesus. Name. You know, when you do that, I know what happened to me. It was just like a bucket of warm oil was poured over my life and a lot of resentment and bitterness and all kinds of stuff just disappeared. That's the power of Jesus 
in your life. God bless you. We will see you either here or there or in the air. Adios. Remember, you can go to phildriscoll.com. All of Phil's music is there and downloadable worldwide. Boy, I've enjoyed this time. It's my hope and prayer that you have been impacted by the sounds. Really, I believe by the sounds of heaven. You know, when you look at it and you study Lucifer, he was in charge of atmosphere control in heaven. That's what his job was. If you read Ezekiel, you'll find that he had melody, harmony, and rhythm built in him. He didn't have a band, he was the band. And boy, when I look at songs that magnify and uplift and point us in God's direction, those songs have a heavenly dimension. And that's what I've given my life to do. In this week's special CD offer, Phil would like you to have Instruments of Praise and Here and Now. And as a bonus, you'll receive The Spirit of America with Phil's own unique performances of the greatest songs of our nation. And you know, it's, it's my prayer that you will put music in your atmosphere, in your world, in your car, in your homes that really bring God's presence. I'm not talking much about it, but you can go to our website. It's www.fieldriscoll.com. And all of my music is there and downloadable, which is wonderful. So you can do it no matter what part of the world you're watching this in. And then years ago, God dealt with me about songs about our country. And I did a CD called The Spirit of America. And you know, the spirit of America, when you think about it, America never would have existed except some God-fearing men that had a relationship with the Lord said, you know, we should create a country that will allow people to worship freely with their choice of worship. And you know, that's what happened. That's where the United States of America exists. We can't ever forget it. I want to make that my free gift to you as you get these CDs. God bless you. I'll see you here or there in the air.